So good evening. Thank you all for coming out here this evening to invest in yourself, in your education, and what you can do to better improve your health on a whole. You know, if we leave our health up to a third party, big pharma, big government, then we're not going to be healthy in the long run because they're in it for to make money. And that's really what it's about to keep us sick. So that's why I'm out here in our community doing these talks to keep people educated and empower you and help you guys understand how powerful we really are in owning our health. So that's why I'm here tonight, and I'm really excited about this talk because this is a brand new talk that I've just created over the last couple months. So let's get started. So tonight, what my intentions are is that we're going to be talking about the immune system, what antigens are, and how they spark the immune system or stimulate the immune system, and what cross-reactivity is. We're going to be talking about toxic food and environmental factors that can overstimulate the immune system. We're gonna be talking about digestion in the microbiome. And then lastly, we're gonna be talking about how to heal your gut naturally. So, what's the big picture? The big picture is, is that ideally, we want to eat nutrients that are dense organic foods. We want strong digestion and absorption the immune system is to be functional where it can recognize foreign antigens versus self antigens, and we'll get into that. Your organs, tissues, and cells actually receive the nutrients from the food that we eat. Growth, repair, and homeostasis is maintained. So your body is strong and imbalanced, and when your body is strong and imbalanced, it can do what it was designed to do very easily, and that is simply to express health. So this is ideally what we want the picture to be. But what's reality, right? Reality is that we're eating a lot of genetically modified foods, food-like substances, and chemicals that have no nutritional value. We are no longer eating food. We are eating food-like substances and chemicals. So when this happens, along with environmental toxins that are getting into our body, your digestion system becomes weak. You can't absorb the nutrients. When we have weak digestion, this activates the immune system. An activated immune system leads to inflammation. And if this, is, if this goes on chronically, every single time we eat, your immune system can actually become oversensitive or hypersensitive to what we're actually eating. Your organs and cells in your tissue become malnourished because they're not actually getting the nutrients that they need to function. Growth and repair does not occur and the internal environment cannot be maintained. When this happens, your body becomes weak, dysfunction occurs, and this is where health challenges come about. And it can be anything, any kind of health challenge. So when we're looking at it, we're really looking at toxicity and deficiency versus nourished and balanced, right? We want that to be ideal, but this is really the reality that we're living in. So let's dive into this a little bit and let's unpack this and really kind of go into what's going on in the food. But first, let's talk about the players. What are the players that are involved in this game? Well, we have food, we've got the digestion system, and then we have the immune system. Well, when our food is toxic, our digestion system becomes weak and the immune system becomes hypersensitive, then what happens to the body and our health? Well, it becomes dysfunctional and we have health issues. It really is that simple. So you got three players in this game. But then we have a fourth player, which is the unknown. And we'll be uncovering that later for you guys. So when we're talking about immunity, let's kind of look at the immune system and what it is actually is designed to do. So the immune system has an intelligence. It can adapt to, what we're, to our environment and what's going on in our bodies, okay? So we have two different types of the immunity. We have the humoral or the innate immunity, which is called the Th2 response, 
which is your physical barriers, right? Your skin, your mucous membranes, sinuses, lungs, GI tract, the flushing action of the urinary tract. Your B cells is B cell, B cell mediated antibodies. And this part of the immunity has no memory at all versus the cell mediated or the acquired immunity, which is specific, and it's the Th1 response. So this is directed at a certain bacteria or a virus, right? When we get the flu, the flu virus comes into the body, it stimulates this acquired immunity or their Th1 cell mediated response, which are uh, formed by the T cells, it's very specific and it takes time, which is called the incubation period. But this part of the immune system is what has memory. So if you have a second exposure to a pathogen, then the immune response is much quicker as a result of that. So what happens is that just like homeostasis in maintaining the internal environment, these Th1 and Th2 parts of the immune system, they sit on a teeter-totter. So they have to be in balance, which is called immunostasis. But what happens is that if it's overstimulated one way or the other, it can get locked into that T2 response or that TH response. And when it gets stuck there, this is where the hypersensitivity comes to play. Okay? So when we're talking about the immune response, right, an antigen is a harmful substance, toxin, protein, carbohydrate, or other foreign substance that enters the body, causes the production of antibodies. So antigen, the word antigen, actually comes from the word antibody generator. Antibodies are known as immunoglobulins, are produced normally by B cells after stimulation by an antigen. So here's the thing about antigens that I really want you to kind of hit home here is that they have to have a certain molecular weight, meaning bigger pieces of proteins and carbohydrates are what can actually create the immune response. So if you have smaller pieces of protein or smaller pieces of carbohydrates or even like fatty acids or nucleic acids, they themselves are not big enough to actually stimulate an immune response. So this is a very important key that we're gonna to touch back on later at, towards the end of this. So when we're talking about proteins and carbohydrates, what do they really look like? Well, this is what a protein molecule looks like. It's a bunch of amino acids that are tightly wound together, okay? And if you break that down, this is kind of what it looks like, about 30 amino acid chain, okay? So proteins are made up of amino acids. Carbohydrates, you got your monosaccharides, which are your single sugars. You got your disaccharides, which are two sugars together. And then you have your polysaccharides, which is a branch chain of them all together, which can be known as glycogen. Okay? A little bit of chemistry. I'm not going to get too much into that. That's all we're going to do. So, but an immune complex is when you have a big size piece of protein or carbohydrate that stimulates the immune system, the antibodies are then formed, and then you have these immune complexes that can then form in the body. And when you have these immune complexes, the immune system is tagging that as a foreign invader, and this is what's saying for other white blood cells that come around and gobble that up. So that's how the immune system actually works. All right? So we have different types of antigens. We've got microbial antigens, which are your virus and your bacteria and other various microorganisms. But then you also have your non-microbial uh, antigens, things like things that we eat, eggs and peanuts, which can then cause allergies, gluten and dairy, which is more of an intolerance, things that are in the air and the environment, pollen, dander, perfume, smoke, chemicals, and transplanted tissues or injected proteins. So where do you think injected proteins come from? What do you think? Vaccinations? Yep. Vaccinations. Good job. All right. So there is a difference between a food allergy and a food intolerance. How many of you guys know somebody that has a food allergy? 
Yes. What are they allergic to? Uh, peanuts. And so are they allowed to have a little bit of peanuts at all or? Anaphylactic shock, exactly. So it's very severe. And that is my point. When you have a food allergy, it is a severe reaction that can be life-threatening, something that you just said, anaphylaxis. A food intolerance, it is something that is not as severe. It's more in that gray area, okay? So when we're talking about a food allergy, it's the diseases of the immune system, it's an exaggerated response, that, that hypersensitivity that I'm talking about. It's that exaggerated response by the immune system to food proteins, and it can cause serious life-threatening even by doing a small amount, okay? Now, a food intolerance are actually reactions in your digestion system, and that is the big difference. So when we're talking about a food allergy, what are we really talking about with the reactions? You mentioned about anaphylaxis. So these are some symptoms that you can have with that anaphylactic shock, right? Another example of that may not be for food, but people that are allergic to bees, right? It causes that same anaphylactic shock where they have to have an EpiPen to get them out of that, that shock or that reaction. And this is what causes the life-threatening thing, is that you've got, you know, coughing and wheezing, your throat can swell up, right? It can... Uh, you have a weak pulse as well, cramping. So there's all kinds of things that can be life-threatening when you have an anaphylactic shock or reaction. But when having symptoms of food intolerances, they're much more in that gray area that we're talking about, right? Acid reflux, behavioral issues in kids, bloating, brain fog, constipation, diarrhea, difficulty concentrating, Eczema, fatigue, joint pain, headaches, migraines, skin rashes, irritations, and stomach aches. So these are some generalized symptoms when we're talking about food intolerances. So I want to talk to you a moment about eczema, right? Eczema is something that happens in the skin. It's a reaction in the skin. So I want to tell you a quick story about a patient. <clears throat> so I have a 14-year-old patient that came to me and she was dealing with eczema on and off for about eight years. She's, you know, had some chiropractic care in the past, but she's never had her gut looked at. So she came to me. This is what her eczema looked like. So can you see how swollen her fingers are? And they almost look like sausages. See how red her hands are. Look, she's got like red gloves from like the middle of her forearm down through her hands. Yep, that's the inflammation in the skin. So that's what her hands looked like when she came in to see me. So we started her on a course of chiropractic care. We started cleaning out her gut, and she was having a sleep issue, so we helped her sleep better. And this is what her hands look like. So how long do you think it took to go from that picture to this picture? Take a guess. A week? Six months. Six months? How about somewhere in between? It took two months. Two months for her body to get back into balance. And this is the one thing that I love about my job in being a chiropractor, is that I'm working with the human body and homeostasis. Homeostasis is always on the job, and it never gets it wrong is just is that our diet and our lifestyle is working towards supporting homeostasis or are we our diet and lifestyle going towards abusing it so it doesn't take long once you find the right thing so when we're talking about food allergies and food intolerances what are the most common triggers well you can see that there's some overlap between these but these are all pretty common. Cow's milk, soy, wheat, fish, shellfish, eggs, peanuts, tree nuts, cow's milk, gluten, wheat, and then the chemicals that are in the food. So let's dive into this. So is cow's milk good or bad? What do you think? Isn't it bad? Are you asking me or are you telling me? 
Okay, so what did you hear that it was bad? The hormones and stuff that's in there. Yeah. Yes, we should not be eating cow's milk anymore. Yes. But if you can find cow's milk that doesn't have the hormones. The only way, the only way that you can do that is to get raw cow's milk, which some states don't even sell it, and it's illegal to sell it in some states. And then you got to go through and pick it up, and it's... So, but that would be the only thing because raw cow's milk from an organic pasture raised cow that actually eats grass is like, is actually a health food. But what happens to the conventionally raised cows, right? Cows are treated inhumanely. All right. They are fed GMO foods, they are injected your growth hormone. So when you take a cow and you inject growth hormone into it, what are you trying to do? You're trying to get it to produce more milk. So when it's trying to produce more milk, it's going to get infections and it's going to, the immune, it's going to wear out the immune system in there. So then they got to continue to pump it with full of antibiotics. Then once the milk comes out of the cow, what do they do? They ultra pasteurize it. Well, what does that mean? They heat it to a high level of temperature to destroy any of the bad stuff in there. Well, do you think if they destroy any of the bad stuff, do you think they destroy the good stuff as well? Yes, exactly. And then they homogenize it to make sure that all the molecules are the same size so the fat doesn't sit on the top like it does in peanut butter. Right? So there is no nutritional value in cow's milk anymore. The way that it is raised and produced, we should not be drinking. That's why when somebody has an allergy, what's the first thing somebody recommends to get them off of? Dairy. Why? Because of this. Okay? So the only thing that cow's milk is good for is that it's rocket fuel for cancer. So there's all kinds of studies that show that the more cow's milk you drink, that this is what you can get as a result of that over one's lifetime. Because of the allergenic nature of it and the hyperstimulation of the immune system, it's just gonna throw everything out of whack. So there's plenty of studies that state this. All right, moving on. Soy. The problem with soy is that 93% of it that is made in this country is genetically modified. It is heavily processed and it is very cheap to make. So if you can find a non-GMO organic soy source that is minimally processed, it is actually a health food. But the problem is, is that it's so heavily processed and genetically modified in this country. And what is soy in? Soy is in everything. If you look at it, it's in everything. So what are some co other common foods that are genetically modified in this country? Well, right up there with soy is corn. What's corn in? Everything, everything right? Soy, sugar beets, canola, aspartame, alfalfa, dairy, cotton, seed, cotton oil, papaya, and zucchini. So what is a genetically modified food? Do you guys know what that is? Have you guys heard of that? Okay, so are genetically modified foods good or bad? What do you guys think? Sure. Yeah. Well, it's nice to, you know, having the students here because you have a younger generation here just trying to f understand what you guys know th about this stuff. So, so yeah, so there, it, there may still be some debate over it, but if you look at what the research shows, it's not good. And I'll explain exactly why. Okay. So you're absolutely right. You're taking genes from a bacteria or a virus 
and you're combining it with a tomato or a zucchini or whatever it is you're trying to do, and you're creating a brand new sequence of DNA that was not ever made before in nature. And our genes and our DNA are that small for a reason. And I believe we should just leave them alone. We should not be messing with that. Because when you're talking about genetically modified foods, there really is only two different types of genetically modified foods that they make. Ones that are herbicide resistant or your Roundup Ready crops. And then your other ones, like your BT corn, that actually produce their own herbicide or insecticide. Okay, so if you have a corn and an insect comes along and tries to eat that corn, well, then that corn then produces this insecticide that kills the bug. And we're eating that and we're expecting it to not do us any harm. So how exactly do genetically modified foods ruin our health? Well, it creates unpredicted alterations and the transgenic protein may be different from the original. So if I'm a scientist, and I'm wanting to take a specific DNA sequence from this bacteria, and I'm gonna extract it, and I'm gonna insert it into the DNA of this fish or crop or whatever, then there might be a miscalculation, like they might splice too much or too little, they might not get the exact location on the new DNA strand, so there's a lot of room for error because the, the genes and the DNA are so small. So when you create that error there, then that new DNA sequence and that genetically modified food may create new proteins that they weren't anticipating in being made. So that's part of the issue. The other issue is I guess talk about the, the BT toxin. It creates holes in the cell walls and the digestion tract. But then the other thing too is that the genes inserted or transgenes inserted in GM crops can actually transfer their DNA to the gut flora. So if you're eating BT corn that is genetically modified to create a insecticide, you eat that corn and some of that, that corn gets digested and that DNA from that corn then gets into the, your gut flora. Well, now what is your gut flora going to do? it's gonna start creating insecticide. It's pretty scary stuff. And then lastly, you know, you have large quantities of the toxic herbicides, which is your Roundup Ready and the glyphosate that's in there that is just heavily doused on these crops that we're then eating them and that's also causing GI issues. All right, so here's a case study of Emily, uh, Dr. Linder, who is an in internal medicine in Chicago here. And she, her quote was that, when my patients tell my patients to avoid genetically modified foods, because in my experience with those foods, there is more allergies and asthma, as well as digestion issues such as gas, bloating, irritable bowel, colitis, and leaky gut. And what emanates from that, she says, is everything. Lots of arthritis, autoimmune issues, anxiety, neurological problems, and anything from an impaired immune response. So Dr. Mark Hyman, you know, he's a pretty well-known MD in this country. He's on TV a lot. But he says that food is just not calories. It's information. It talks to your DNA and tells it what to do. The most powerful tool in changing your own health and the environment and the entire world is what's on the end of your fork. And you know what's good about that? You have 100% control on that. So here's another study that was done in the Cell Research Journal in 2011. And in this study, they're talking about the same thing. Eating food is like eating information. It tells your cells what to do. Plant and animal sera has microRNA in it that is trans... That that is information for our cells and can modulate their behavior. So basically what they're saying is that the more GMO foods you consume, the more you get bad information that is not natural and can change the behavior of a cell to do it, what its proper function is. A cell can lose its identity and all of its normal functions. 
differentiation, apoptosis, which is a 50 cent word that means it uh, induces self death, proliferation, immune response, and maintenance of cell tissue and tissue identity. So pro proliferation, what does that sound like? If a cell loses its ability to stop dividing, what is that? Cancer. Right? That's what cancer comes from. So there was a study done in 2017, and what they did is that they surveyed 3,200 people that switched from a non-GMO switch to non-GMO and organic diet. And the results were from mild to significant improvements. So just look at some of the results that they have just by simply switching their diet. What's number one on the list? Come on. Digestion, 82 or 85.2% improvement just by switching to a non-GMO and organic diet. But look at all these different things, food allergies and food sensitivities, 50%. Overweight or obesity, 54%. Joint pain, 47%. Seasonal allergies, 46%. Gluten sensitivities, 42%. So you can see that just by switching up your diet can affect so many different things in your body. Because the thing about your body is that it can handle a tremendous amount of abuse and it can compensate but it can only compensate so long. So when you're continually eating fast foods and processed foods and genetically modified foods, your, your body's becoming weaker and weaker because it's being malnourished. So when you go shopping in the grocery store, this is what you wanna look for. Non-GMO project verified and USA DA organic. These are the two symbols that you want because Non-GMO food is not always organic. Organic is always non-GMO. Okay? All right. So, gluten. What do we got for gluten? Well, gluten, the problem with gluten is that it is so far from what it was originally made to be. So they have hybridized gluten and when they've taken two breeds and kind of hybridized, hybridized it together, that new plant is now making and creating new proteins, okay? When they're harvesting the gluten, they treat it with chemicals and enzymes to create these wheat isolates, which are food emulsifiers and gelling agents which these wheat isolates are found in a lot of different processed foods. It's what your, your meat glue is. It's in soups. It's in wine. It's in everything. So when we are treating this wheat, it freaks out our immune system. So you're creating these new allergic proteins. So the more that you eat it, the more we can't digest it, the more it freaks out the immune system. This is half of the problem with what's going on with gluten. The other half is that they use it, they spray Roundup on it before they harvest it as a drying agent. So not only are the way that they're producing the wheat, they're spraying all these toxins on it, which is the other half of the component. It's not that people may not be allergic or sensitive to gluten, it's just that their body doesn't like poison. Okay, so this leads to leaky gut issues, intestinal permeability, and inflammation. So we're talking about the next thing, which is fish and shellfish, right? There's just a protein that's in there, this tryptomycin, that can be challenging and difficult for people to digest. And this is what can then spark the shellfish out, shellfish or fish allergy. All right, moving on. Eggs and peanuts. How many peanut allergies do you guys have in your school? Uh, a ton. Yeah. What about eggs? You guys have a lot of egg allergies? Not sure. Yeah, so you're not as well known as that. But peanuts, like everybody knows about peanuts. 
Okay. So what is all this sudden explosion in this peanut allergy? What is it coming from? Because back in the mid 80s, we didn't have this. It's only been since like early 90s, mid 90s till now that we've had these peanut allergies. Are the peanuts changing? Mm -mm. They use chicken embryos and egg cultures to make vaccines and to grow viruses on them. They also use peanut oil in vaccines as an additive and an immune stimulator, what's called an adjuvant. So when this happens, you're forcing the immune, like how, does, how do things normally come into our body? Through our mouth, right? We breathe it in or we stick it and it goes into our digestion tract. So the, this is you know, your TH2 response, right? Your sinuses, your lungs, your gut, your throat. This is the natural way in which things are supposed to come into the body so that your body can then process it in the appropriate way. You stick into a needle in a syringe and you inject it into your arm, you bypass that whole thing. You are now forcing your body and your immune system to do something about it. So the vaccine schedule is simply overstimulating the immune system. So when you look at this, back in 1983, according to the CDC, right, zero to 18 years of age, 11 doses of four vaccines, and you are fully vaccinated. Now, look at that, zero to 15 months, you're getting more than you did in 18 years in 15 months in the first, first year and a half of life. 26 doses of 10 vaccines, zero to six years of age, 39 doses of 10 vaccines, zero to 18, you're getting 69 doses of 16 different vaccines. And we'll get into how this can actually confuse your immune system. So if you're putting peanut oil in vaccines and you're getting 69 doses of that in 18 years, do you think it's going to cause some peanut allergies? Say yes. This is part of the reason as to why the peanut allergy, it's not the whole picture, but this is a big contributing factor to it. And there's a couple other components that I'm gonna go over in a little bit that is contributing to that. Why, why are they still using it? Why? <laughs> because the more allergies and things, that, well, what else are they gonna sell in the back end? EpiPens, right? How much does an EpiPen cost now? So it's about keeping our kids sick and it's all about money. That's really what this is about. Okay. So here's a couple studies I wanna go over about this. So this is a study that was actually done back in 1999. So most anaphylactic reactions and some eutocarial reactions or skin reactions to gelatin containing measles, mumps, and rubella monovalent vaccines are associated with IgE-mediated gelatin allergy. So the IgE-mediated is just the, the immunoglobin that is triggered when you have an allergy. The DTaP immunization history suggests that the gelatin-containing DTaP vaccine may have a causal relationship to the development of this gelatin allergy. So the ingredients that are in the vaccines, if you're overstimulating it and that immune system can't differentiate it anymore, that's what's, when I'm talking about the scale, that's what's going to tip the scale to that TH2 mediated and it's going to get locked there. And that's where the sensitivities come from and the allergies. The other thing is that in most of the vaccines, there's aluminum. So aluminum is an adjuvant that can create a, a strong immune response. So immunizations with aluminum adjuvants, as long with uh, parasitic infections, induces a Th2 type cell mediated immune response. We propose that the immunization with aluminum adjuvants in general is not favorable for induction of regulatory mechanisms. And in this context, of the hygiene hypothesis in the microbiome, 
but it can be viewed as an amplifying factor and significant contributing risk factor for allergies, especially in a genetic susceptible pop subpopulation. So in other words, what they're basically saying is that the more you inject aluminum into your body, it is stimulating this TH2 response and can be a, con a huge contributing factor to other allergies. Here's a quote from a world-renowned immunologist in his book, Vaccines and Autoimmunity, right? Uh, adjuvants are often employed to enhance the development of an eff efficacious specific response. The problem lies with what type of immune response is happening. The Th1 is a cell-mediated immune response, which happens after naturally acquiring an infection. And then the Th humoral response kicks in with antibodies to ensure immunity. But here's the thing, is that they have to work in tandem together. Vaccinations use adjuvants to stimulate the Th2 response, which bypasses the Th1 altogether, which puts the immune system into a perpetual state of confusion. And this can actually kick in and cause, trigger autoimmune issues. So again, right, the natural way that we're trying to have this teeter-totter with our immune system, Th1, Th2, when you're continuing to stimulate it with, through vaccination, you're pegging it and it's getting stuck off balance, which is what he's staying here. So it's just kind of a review that the two different uh, types of immunity that we were talking about there. All right, so the last thing, so we talked about egg and peanut allergies, but the last thing that was on there was tree nuts. And I wanna talk about something that's called cross-reactivity or what's called molecular mimicry. So basically, when you have a normal functioning immune system, all right, we have three different antigens here. We've got gliadin, which is a protein in gluten, potato and casein, which is a protein in milk. Now you can see that they have different receptors on here. So when you have a normal functioning immune response, your immune system knows what to respond to. So if you have a sensitivity to gluten, then you're gonna have a reactive response to gluten because it can identify those antigens or those receptors on that protein. It can distinguish between these and not cause a response in a normal functioning immune system. Now, if you have a reaction to gluten and you keep eating gluten and you keep eating gluten and one year goes by, two years goes by, and this reaction starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Remember, we're talking about that teeter-totter of the immune system. It starts to get pegged one way or the other, right? then the immune system can differentiate and it becomes dysfunctional. So now what it used to only react to with gluten, because you have similar, you have two similar epitopes or antigens there, it can no longer distinguish. So now every time you eat milk or dairy, you're gonna to respond to gluten and dairy, okay? So this is what we're talking about is cross reactivity or molecular mimicry. Let me say the same thing, only different. So when we're talking about this, we got different foods. So let's just say that this is an amino acid sequence. You know, this is just random letters, all right? But casein, this is what the, the amino acid protein sequence is. Well, rice is not 100%, but you've got some similarities there. So if you're starting to react to milk, and now all of a sudden you're eating a lot of rice too, then you're gonna start reacting to both of them or oats, whatever that cross reactivity is. So this is how eating, becoming certain, sensitive to certain foods over time, if you don't eliminate those foods, is going to expand into other foods. And this is how autoimmunity is developed. Because just like the same sequencing and the molecular mimicking, well, if you have the gliadin or the, the protein on, on wheat, right, here's your sequence. Well, here's your cere cerebellar sequence of your cerebellar or nervous tissue in your brain. 
So every time you eat gluten, it's, your immune system is going to attack your cerebellum. And you can get neurological issues. Or you can have thyroid issues. Or you can have skin issues. Or whatever the autoimmune is triggering. You know, they've categorized over 150 different diseases as autoimmune. And this is how it happens. Make sense? Okay. So let's talk about, I promise it's not all bad. It may seem like that, but it's just to kind of get through this. So if we're eating all these allergenic foods and are injecting all these foreign proteins that are causing the immune system to tip one way, well, what has that done to our kids? What are some statistics that have happened over the last 15, 20 years? Well, let's take a look at that. From 2009 to 2010, a study of uh, 38,000 children, infant to 18 years of age, indicated that 8% have food allergies. 38% have food of food al 38% of food allergic children have a history of severe reactions. 30% have multiple food allergies, and of the allergic children, peanut is the most prevalent allergen, followed by milk and then shellfish. And then in 2012, 5.6% or 41 million children have had some kind of food allergy in the past 12 months. Some more CEC reports that children increased by food allergies in children increased by 50% between. One, uh, 1997 and 2011. And between 97 and 2008, the prevalence of peanut or tree allergy appeared to have more than tripled. Well, what else has gone up since the early 90s? The amount of vaccines that we're getting. Okay. Children hospitalized for food allergies tripled between 1990s and the mid-2000s. More than 40% of children with food have experienced a severe allergic reaction, such as anaphylaxis, and medical procedures to treat it resulting from food allergies increased 380% from 2007 to 2016. So why would they want to stop this? Because they're making a boatload of money off of this. Yeah, but don't these people have kids too? Yeah. But do doctors really follow their own advice? I don't know the answer to that, but. So let's just kind of review what we went over so then we can pivot into talking about the digestion and the microbiome. So we have your immune system. What is your immune system designed to do? Well, it's supposed to recognize foreign invaders. It's to tag them with antibodies which then other white blood cells come over and digest them and gobble them up, okay? But what happens is that when we consume foods, such as cow's milk, which is dead food, soy, which is GMO, wheat, which is processed and toxic, fish with the protein antigen that stimulates the immune system, shellfish, eggs and peanuts that are hypersensitivity, and tree nuts that are cross-reactive, the more we eat these types of things, if we cannot digest them, is what then triggers the immune system. Because where is 80% of your immune system located? In your gut. So if you have weak digestion and it's tr trickling out into the small intestine, that's gonna trigger the immune system. And the immune system's gotta clean that up every single time you eat. So what causes weak digestion? What do you think? The $62 million question. Bad food. <laughs> That's part of it. <laughs> yes. But do we have any of this? <laughs> Stress. Stress on the body is what causes weak digestion. And then we're going to talk about the number four player that we were talking about earlier, which is that unknown. So what does stress do to the body? Well, it causes subluxations. B12 
being a chiropractor, you have 24 vertebrae in your spine. And these vertebrae are supposed to move independently of one another. So when you have a subluxation, those vertebrae kind of get stuck together and they don't move and they move together as a unit. That is what we're calling is a subluxation. And I'll show you in a little bit. Subluxations can then lead to sympathetic dominance, which is what I'll go over in a moment. Okay. This Subluxations and sympathetic dominance decreases vagal tone to the digestion system, or it simply weakens it. Then you get dysbiosis or an imbalance of the bacteria in the gut flora in the small intestine, which is then going to lead to nutritional deficiencies. And when your body is nutritionally deficient, what happens then? Oh, look at that. You get spinal muscle contraction, which then contributes to more subluxations. So you've got this vicious cycle that's going to be happening when we have stress on the body. So we're talking about subluxations. This is what I'm talking about here. You can see that this vertebrae is kind of stuck back, which is putting extra pressure on the disc and then that nerve. Okay. Now, what is sympathetic dominance? Well, our subconscious nervous system we have two sides to it. We have our sympathetic nervous system and our parasympathetic nervous system. So that sympathetic nervous system is that fight or flight response where you just go, go, go all day long, that type A personality, okay? The parasympathetic is the opposite of that, which is the rest, digest, recuperate, heal, and reproduce mode. So just like the immune system with Th1 and Th2 that sits on a teeter-totter, so does your autonomic nervous system. Sympathetic and parasympathetics are opposite, and they have to be in balance. But what happens, again, if one tilts one way or the other, and you become sympathetically dominant, then that is going to run the whole show. And I'll show you exactly what's going to happen there. So how else, besides having that, being in that fight-or-flight mode, right? Because if a bear walks through that door, I got to stand here and I got to fight that thing or I got to run away. But we're not supposed to stay there. It's only supposed to be transient. But if you're sympathetically dominant 24-7, 365, that's going to be a bad thing. Well, how else can we get to become sympathetically dominant? Does our diet affect that at all? Yes. So eating refined carbohydrates or sugar intake causes that sympathetic dominance. But it can also be from emotional stress too, being overwhelmed, having emotional issues with relationship issues, with family, friends, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. Okay? And when we are sympathetically dominant, where do we feel that on our body? There is a physical location on our body that we feel sympathetic dominance. Where is that? Right here at the base of your skull. So you're going to get that subluxation there that is then going to affect, and I'll show you exactly what it is. So when you have this, it's going to decrease vagal tone to the digestion system, and I'll go over that. So when we're looking at your suboccipital muscles, right, this is what we're looking at at the base of our skull. And when we become sympathetically dominant, this is what happens. Muscles contract and it rotates that first vertebrae. Okay? So how do you know if you've got a subluxation at the base of your skull? Well, one thing is that you'll have be pain or you have that tightness or stiffness. But again, that's only going to be there in the most extreme state. But what you can do is you can go home in front of the mirror, stand there, looking at the mirror, close your eyes, tilt your head forward once, tilt your head backwards once, and then come back to a neutral position and hold still, do not move, open your eyes. And then you're gonna look at the bottom of your ears. See how the head's tilted? So you look at the bottom of your ears, and if they're not level, you've got a subluxation and you're probably sympathetically dominant. Right? Being aligned, is what chiropractors do, being misaligned. Your ears are going to be off. How does it look? How do subluxations look in the rest of the body? 
Well, they look different ways, right? You got muscles on one side that's contracted. It's going to twist and rotate the vertebrae. And when you look at the bigger picture, you can also look at your shoulders. So you're standing there in front of the mirror, look at your shoulders. Because if they're even, then you're in alignment. But more times than not, you'll have something that's like this or like this. Or you'll be like this. So you can check to see if you're out of alignment or you got subluxations just by looking in the mirror at home. So when we're talking about that vagal tone, what are we really talking about? Well, when we have, if we take a cross section of one of these nerves, this is what we're looking at. You have a cross section of the nerve and each spinal nerve that comes out from the spine is broken down into three components. You've got a motor component that is your brain talking to your muscles. You've got an autonomic component, which is your brain talking to your organs. And then you have this sensory component with your brain talking and worrying about posture, pain, and temperature. So this is the one thing I want you guys to understand about this, is that this sensory component of all spinal nerves makes up less than 10% of all nerve transmissions. So what does that mean? That means that pain only shows up in the most acute or extreme situation. Nine times out of 10, you're gonna have muscle contraction or spasms or weakness. Your organs aren't gonna function properly. You could have sinus and allergy issues, low energy, digestion problems, breathing problems. So, looking at the body from the front, right, and having postural deviations, but if you also look at somebody from the side, people that have this rounded shoulder and these anterior head carriage is also going to cause subluxations up and through there, okay? So how does that subluxation affect your gut? Well, I'm so glad that you asked. So coming out from the brain stem, we have this vagus nerve that comes down and it innervates the heart, the lungs, the digestion system, the liver, gallbladders, pancreas, adrenals, all the way up into the first half of the intestines. So when I'm talking about vagal tone, when your, your spine's in alignment, you're going to have plenty of nerve connection from the brain to the gut. But when you have that subluxation, you're sympathetically dominant, it basically mutes that nerve and decreases the function in all those organs. So that's how having a subluxation up here, having anterior head carriage, eating a high diet and refined carbohydrates and sugar, and being emotionally overwhelmed or having relationship issues, that you're stuck into that sympathetically dominant mode is going to weaken your digestion system. So we're talking about the vagus nerve, right? What does decreased vagal tone actually do? Well, it can compromise the mucosal lining. If your mucosal lining becomes compromised, what are you going to experience? Heartburn, reflux. Where is, where is that mucosal The mucosal lining, yeah. yeah. So that's a great question. So our entire gastrointestinal tract is nothing but a big hollow tube right? So we have two layers of muscle. We have an outer layer of muscle and then an inner layer of muscle, okay? One that helps mix it and the other one that helps squeeze it through, okay? On the inside of the, the gut, from, you know, the mouth all the way down to the anus, there's the inside has this big, thick mucus layer there, which is there for several purposes. One is to protect it against the acid and the alkalinity of the gallbladder, Another one is to help lubricate it, to help slide the food through. Okay, that's a great question. But it also decreases stomach acid, which then is going to decrease enzyme secretion and gut motility. So this is where the weakened digestion system comes from. Okay, increased vagal tone, mucosal lining heals, and it increases stomach acid, enzyme secretion, and GI motility. So this is why it's very important that when you have digestion issues or food sensitivities, 
to get adjusted. This is the second piece of what's going on and how the body works. So what causes weak digestion? Well, subluxations, which we just talked about. Emotional stress, a poor diet, eating lots of refined sugar and GMO foods. Sympathetic dominance, large portion size meals. You know, you go out to eat and there's a, everything's family size or family style. So everybody's eating and eating and eating until they can't get up. So when you eat large amounts of food in one sitting, this is going to negatively affect digestion. Here's one, not chewing your food. So for whatever reason, this seems to be the hardest one for people to change. We don't have the time to sit and eat. So when you sit and eat, I want you to chew each bite about 40 times. Each bite should become like a liquid soup before you swallow it. Because we're always eating on the run. I mean, we're all guilty of this. You know, we're taking something, we take three bites and we swallow the food whole. And we wonder why we have digestion issues. Okay? So slowing down and enjoying your food, right? Eating's fun, right? So chew your food. And then the other thing is being enzyme deficient. Having, lacking certain enzymes because of the decreased vagal tone or eating a diet that is high in processed and GMO foods. So... What's after that? Well, then after the stomach and digestion, we've got the microbiome. So do you realize that there is about the same number of bacteria in our gut as human cells in the body? About 38 trillion bacteria and non-human cells versus 30 trillion human cells? How important is the microbiome? You guys know, heard about this at all? Not really? Okay. So the microbiome is another, it's a fancy word. It just says the bacteria, the good bacteria in our small intestine. Okay. Because in our small intestine, we have good bacteria. We've got bad bacteria. We've got opportunistic bacteria. And then we've got candida, which is a yeast. Now, all of these microorganisms have to be in balance in the small intestine. This is what is a, it really important because it affects many other aspects of our health. And if our microbiome is out of balance, you can, you can almost consider it an 11th organ. And it's just like losing your kidney or your liver or your spleen. Well, we can live without our spleen. But it's really, really important to keep that in balance because it affects so many other things. It affects digestion. It affects immunity. It affects heart health, brain health, and hormonal health with weight management. A quick story about this, <clears throat> about the, the weight management aspect. I have a 73-year-old a diabetic that's been on, he's been diabetic for about 10 years, and he's been on medication for about 10 years. You know, he goes to a trainer twice a week. <clears throat> His diet's okay. But he wanted to come to me and wanted me to help him with his, his health and his diabetes. And we were working with him. We changed up his diet a little bit. We were giving him some enzyme supplements. We were getting him adjusted. And it took till about month seven or eight until we really started to affect, because he has so much other inflammation and other issues going on. It took about seven or eight months to kind of get the inflammation in his body under control. Once we started working on the microbiome, now he's been going to a trainer for two times a week for who knows how long. He never lost any weight. Once we started to correct this, the weight just came off. So it is very, very important to keep that microbiome in balance. And what, how can you get that out of balance? When you consume a lot of sugar and genetically modified foods and you have weak digestion. That's what causes all of this, the imbalance. <clears throat> so here's a study done this year, last month actually, it was published. 
The use of probiotics is beneficial in promoting immunomodulation and reducing clinical symptoms of allergies. So to kind of wrap it all up, we're kind of coming towards the end here. Now this next slide, there's a lot of information on this, but it really sums up everything that I've just been talking about very eloquently. So this was done last year. So I'm going to read this through this and then we'll kind of talk about it when we get done. So recent research points to a central role of the microbiome, which is highly influenced by multiple environmental and dietary factors. Huh. Environmental, right? Toxins in the air, the vaccines, dietary factors, GMO, glyphosate. It is well established that the microbiome can modulate the immune response from cellular development to organ and tissue formation, exerting its effects through multiple interactions with both the innate and the acquired branches of the immune system, Th1, Th2. Here, we review the potential role of the skin, respiratory, and gastrointestinal tract microbiomes in allergic diseases. The gastrointestinal tract, the microbiome, has been proven to be important in developing either effector or in or tolerant responses to different antigens by balancing the activities of the Th1 and Th2 cells. In the lung, the microbiome may play a role in driving asthma endotype polarization by adjusting the balance between Th2 and T17 patterns. Bacterial dysbiosis, dysbiosis is a 50 cent word, means that the microbiome is out of balance. You've got the opportunistic bacteria that is growing and the good guys aren't, aren't uh, proliferating. So the bacterial dysbiosis is associated with chronic inflammatory disorders of the skin such as atopic dermatitis and psoriasis. Thus, the microbiome can be considered a therapeutic target for treating inflammatory diseases such as allergies. Despite some limitations, intervention with probiotics, prebiotics, or symbiotics, which symbiotics, I didn't know what that was, I looked it up, is a combination of both probiotics and prebiotics in one thing. So I didn't know that. That was something new. Seems promising for the development of preventative therapy by restoring altered microbiome functionality or as an adjuvant for specific immunotherapy. So basically, this does a great job of scientifically saying what I just did, what I just went over, okay? So how can I say this same thing, only different, so that you guys can understand it? All right, so we've got poor diet and stress on the body. When that happens, it leads to subluxations and sympathetic dominance. Subluxations and sympathetic dominance then goes towards decreased vagal tone and weakens your digestion system. Weak digestion leads to leaky gut issues and dysbiosis in the small intestine. And then we have the immune imbalance and inflammation, which then leads to food sensitivities and health challenges. So how many of you have heard that, oh, take a probiotic because it's going to help digestion, right? Well, what if some people take it and they don't get any better. They don't get any different. Or some people may be a little bit less bloated. Okay? So where is the microbiome located? Small and large intestine. What's above it? Well, we've got our stomach. And we've got lifestyle factors. Right? So just by taking a probiotic to balance out your gut or strengthen your immune system can help if these other things are in check and the person doesn't eat bad. But if somebody's taking a probiotic and they're eating nothing but sugar and GMO foods and they're stressed out and their body is subluxated and they're sympathetically dominant, it doesn't matter how much probiotics they're gonna take. It's not gonna do you any good because you're missing three other steps. Does that make sense? So this is kind of basically how the body works. When we're constantly bombarding it with toxins and toxic food and vaccines, 
This is what's going to happen. So how do we fix it? Well, the very first thing that we need to do is change the diet and manage the stress. I cannot emphasize this enough. You cannot out-exercise a bad diet. If you want to get healthy and you're sick, you need to eat well. But you have to be able to digest it. Okay? So how do we fix the subluxations and the sympathetic dominance? Well, you need to get adjusted and have the right enzyme nutrition. How do we correct the decreased vagal tone and weak digestion? Well, you need to get adjusted and have enzyme nutrition. How do we fix the gut? Well, you got to get adjusted and fix the enzyme nutrition. And you got to balance out the immune system too. So can you see how this really is a cascade? You've got to get to the highest priority first. You have to address this. If you don't address this, you can get adjusted all you want. You can take all the supplements you want. You're not going to get better. Because when we have that stress on our body and we're eating poorly, your body can't play catch up. You're not nourishing it. And because the body burns nutrition like a forest fire with a 100 mile an hour tailwind. You literally cannot put enough food in your mouth fast enough to keep up with the stress and the poor diet. Because when you fix these couple things up here, guess what? This down here, it'll take care of itself. The question is, how much damage has been done and how long have you been sitting on that? Because somebody who's you know, been on uh, medication for heartburn for 20 years, right, and has all the other health issues, that's a different ballgame than somebody that just has heartburn for two or three months. So it depends on the chronicity of how, what you're experiencing and how long it's been there and how much damage is done. But there is good news. The thing about the human body is that every single cell in your entire body has this innate intelligence and this desire to thrive, to heal, to grow, repair. You just have to give it its food so that it can do its job and remove the waste. And the body, the, the cells, the organs, the tissue will do its job. This is what makes my job so easy. When people come in, they're employing me to help them with their health. So when they are open, when they are students of themselves, when they take the advice that I give them, they go home and they follow it and they fully engage in their health and take 100% responsibility for it, we get the best results. When people don't want to own their health, when they don't want to take it and really dive into it, and they don't want to change things, then they're just wasting their time and money. And it really is that simple. Because again, homeostasis is always on the job. It always gets it right, and it never gets it wrong. Okay? So the big secret about healing food sensitivities and allergies is that, remember in the beginning I was talking about the molecular weight, proteins, carbohydrates? Well, if you properly digest your food, then the immune system has nothing to respond to. When we are eating genetically modified foods, there are new proteins and toxins in there that our body does not make enzymes to digest those proteins, which is then what continues to trigger the immune response every single time you eat it. But if you can properly digest it, the immune system has nothing to respond to. So, eating a clean diet, non-GMO, organic, balanced diet... Right? Strengthening your digestion system. Supporting the immune system and inflammations. Inflammations? Inflammations. That's what I said. All right. Um, so what is one thing that a digestion system and the immune system are heavily dependent on to function? 
enzymes. So when the more processed food and genetically modified foods we eat, we're eating a dead food diet. They don't have any enzymes in there to digest your food, which is why eating a clean diet with lots of raw fruits and vegetables, raw fruits and vegetables contain the enzymes in there to actually aid in the digestion process. So when you take enzymes to digest your food and to strengthen your immune system and to clean up that toxicity, it's a different ball game. So how do we strengthen your digestion system? Well, again, it comes back to the first thing, stress management. We have to identify where is that source of stress on your body. I could have 10 people that walk in with allergies, fibromyalgia, migraines. There's 10 different causes of what's causing each one of them because everybody perceives stress differently. Everybody holds stress differently in their body and it affects them differently. So you have to look at each individual person as to what's going on. Eating a clean diet, chew, thoroughly chewing your food, chiropractic adjustments and digestive enzymes. Okay, now when we're talking about diet, diet is really not that hard, right? Get back to eating whole food. When you're eating mac and cheese or Cheetos or whatever, you're not eating food. You are eating dead food that is genetically modified and is toxic. You are eating food-like substances. So get back to eating whole food. What do I mean by that? Well, what's in an apple? Apple. What's in a banana? Banana. What about chicken? Oh, it's chicken. Get back to eating whole food. Non-GMO as much as possible, organic, organic fruits and vegetables, pasture-raised chickens and eggs, and wild-caught fish. Farm-raised fish and anything else that is conventionally raised that doesn't have the non-GMO verified or the organic label on it, simply do not buy it. It's that simple. It really is. If you want to be healthy, this is what you have to do. Okay? So... I have a demonstration to show you about enzymes. So I have some yummy oatmeal here that I just made today. Okay. So you guys can see this, right? It's moist, but it's not wet, right? And it's not dry. It's kind of somewhere in between, all right? <clears throat> so one's going to be the control. I have my little box of zymes. I'm going to take out two capsules of enzymes, and we're just going to dump them in there. Now, I want you to notice how long this takes, too. All right. So, both capsules in. I'm going to start with this one. I'm going to mix this up a little bit. Pretending that it's in the stomach, right? All right. I'm going to let that sit. And I'm going to start to mix this one up. Notice anything that's different? Right? Look how watery it's becoming and liquidy. This one is still kind of clumpy. Look at that. What was that, maybe a minute? Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. That really is amazing. Yep. 
So again, the secret to food allergies and all of that is that you can't, your immune system has nothing to respond to if it's digested. All right, so we're just about to close this out. So, I'm gonna wrap all this up, all right? So you guys really understand this. So we have our four players, okay? Our toxic food that we're eating or the environmental factors along with the vaccines. We have the digestion that becomes weak, your immune system that becomes hypersensitive and your body is dysfunctional because it is toxic, malnourished, and exhausted, okay? So you really have two options of going about this and trying to correct this. Well, you can be what's called defensive health, where you have your weakened body that is not functioning properly. You can manage your diet and your lifestyle, you can wait for a symptoms or crisis to occur, and then you can take action by taking medication, okay? It's not right or wrong, it's just one way that people approach their health. Or you can go on the offensive, okay? Where you identify and manage where that source of stress is at on your body. You take action by creating healthy habits changing what's on the end of your fork, chewing your food, exercising, getting adjusted, right? All those healthy habits, sleeping at night, which then strengthens the body so then the environment doesn't affect you at all. So that's really the two different ways that you can approach your, your health and your symptoms. So can chiropractic and enzyme nutrition help you? Well, do you have food sensitivities? Do you want to feel better when you eat? Do you want to strengthen your digestion or your immune system? Do you have a chronic health issue? So how do we really evaluate your digestion system? There's different ways that we can do that. First, we're going to take a history, figure out exactly what's going on and how long it's been there. Then I'm going to have you do a food diary of six days of everything that you eat and drink, because I want to see what you're putting into your body. Then we can do blood work to determine if you've got leaky gut issues or infections that are down there. We can do blood work to see if there's a gluten sensitivity or any cross reactivity, which can then lead to autoimmune issues. We can do a 24 hour urinalysis, which evaluates your digestion function from a chemistry perspective. And then we can do a fasting digestive exam. So what does that mean? Well, We've got these visceral stress points on the body that tell me something different about a different organ system, a nutrient imbalance, or a body process. There's 43 of them. So when I do a nutritional or a, a fasting exam on my patients, they come in first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. I adjust their spine to minimize all of the mechanical stress to their system, and then we evaluate these 43 stress points. I then give them a balanced food to eat, which is a tablespoon of food mixed in water that has protein, fat, carbs, and fiber in it. They drink it. We wait 45 minutes to allow your body to digest and absorb and get that nutrition to where it needs to go. Because if your body can do that appropriately, well then these stress points should disappear. But what if it's positive before? And what if it's positive afterwards? What if you've got 20 things that are positive? Where do you start? And this is where the priority system comes into play because you gotta take care of the top priority first because that's how homeostasis works. When you get to the top dog that makes them decisions and you nourish him, everything else will naturally follow the chain of command. It has to, every single time. It's how the body works. So then once we do this evaluation, if this is normal, it shows me where your deviation from normal is at. All right, look, you're right there. Okay, great. So then when we do that and find that, then we put you on a care plan that will bring your body back up into balance. And what does the care plan consist of? Well, again, the very first thing is the stress management component. This is the missing piece that people that have chronic health issues 
do not understand, have not identified, and don't know where to look. This is what I've become an expert in, in finding it on people's bodies and helping them understand how their bodies work. We modify the diet, give you some exercises to do at home, get you adjusted, and take supplements. All five of these things have to work in together for you to get the best results. And then it's just a matter of time. Remember that girl with the eczema, her hands, right? Two months. Got a couple other testimonials real quick. So Wade, he was an interesting character. He came to me, I do another talk on digestion disorders, and he was hanging, he has this like random low back pain. And I'm like, all right, well, he's getting adjusted regularly, but this low back pain just comes and goes and he's no rhyme or reason. So I was like, come to my digestion talk and just hear me out and see what I have to say. My digestion, how is that affecting my lower back? So he came, he decided to come in for an evaluation and looked at his diet right? Three donuts for breakfast, two Mountain Dews throughout the day, right? His diet is nothing but sugar. Well, sugar is going to affect the small intestine sympathetic dominance, which is also going to affect the kidneys. Where are the kidneys located? Low back. So we changed up his diet, strengthened his gut, corrected his microbiome, supported his kidneys, and after two months of being on the enzymes, he comes in and he's like, hey, doc, will these enzymes help me make, make me eat ice cream again? I'm like, why, Wade? Because he never mentioned anything about ice cream before. He's like, I could never eat ice cream because it would just ruin my gut. And I decided to give it a try. And I ate ice cream one day and I had no reaction. I ate ice cream two days in a row, which I never could have done before, and had no reaction. I'm like, huh, of course I knew. It. But like, he didn't tell me that, though. And that was just a nice little side effect. Because when you put the body in balance, when you correct the digestion system and clear out the microbiome, the body can handle what you throw at it. Okay, now Rick, so Wade was kind of an easy case. Rick was a little bit more, let's say, severe and chronic. So Rick was 6'2", about 145 pounds, and in his early 30s. He got the flu one year and never recovered. So he's been on disability for 10 years before he walks into my door. Yeah. So he comes in and... We do this nutritional evaluation on him, and we take a look at his diet. And his diet is the blandest thing I've ever seen. He eats like four things because his system is so sensitive that if he eats the wrong thing, it physically puts him in bed for three days. So he eats this very narrow thing, which is why he's so thin. So I worked with him and worked with him, and it took about three years to kind of get him back on track. And we put about 45 pounds on him, but it took three years. So when you find the right thing and you nourish the body, it will do its job. So regarding your food sensitivities and your allergies, you really only have two things to do. You can do the same thing, get the same results, or you can try something new, do something different, and get different results. It's up to you.